in this video we're going to take a look at some of the challenges from the Angstrom 2022 CTF. I was going to take a bit of a break after the Hamcon CTF but I've done the Angstrom CTF a couple of years in a row now and the challenges have been particularly good so let's take a look at some of them. We'll start off with the missed category, the first one was a sanity check which just asked us to connect to the discord and then find the flag and submit it so I'll not bother with that one, let's just start off with interwebs and the description says Clam's super powerful mega server of doom is running all of the Angstrom CTF's infrastructure. For many challenges, it's important that you're able to connect to it. Get a free flag by connecting to, and then we're given the server address and port number to connect to. We literally just need to connect to it. So just type it in the terminal and we get back our first flag. The next challenge is called Among Us, and the description says, one of these is not like the others. And we've got a file to download, so I'm gonna download it with wget. And we can see that it's a tar file. So we can use tar xvf to extract it. And we've got this new directory has been created out. And you can see it's added a lot of files to the directory, maybe a hundred files or more. So let's go into the directory. We can list the files in here, but what we're probably going to do is try and find out which one is different. So I'm going to use ls-lart. The dash l is going to use a long list in a format. Dash a is going to show the hidden files and folders. Dash t is going to order by time. And then R is going to reverse the order. So if we run that, we'll see that we've got lots of files that were created at 1.45 p.m. And they're all 20,000 bytes. But we have one other file, which was created one minute later and is one byte bigger. And that one will be our correct flag. The reason I use the dash L-A-R-T, I'm, just kind, of, that's, I'm kind of used to using that command. I would typically run that instead of, in fact, if I run L, it's going to run the same thing without the R. And the reason we wanted to use the dash R was because rather than scrolling up to the top to see what the newest file is, it's easier just to have it listed in reverse order for me. The next challenge is called Confetti and the description says From the sky, drop like confetti, all eyes on me. So VIP, all of my dreams, from the sky, drop like confetti. I'm guessing that's some kind of song that I'm not aware of. Let's W get this image. And there's a few things we could do here. We might want to have a look and see is there any strings. Let's have a look for strings greater than 10. See is there anything of interest in there. It doesn't look like it. We could have a look at the EXIF data. So we can use EXIF tool and see if we've got any comments in here, anything of interest. We could use something like foremost to see if anything is extracted out of it. Let's have a look in output. There isn't, again, another tool we could use, similar, bin walk, and see do we get any files out of that. And I think we are, actually. Let's have a look. Oh, wrong one. Let's have a look at the file types. Empty, empty, zlib. Okay, no. All right, I'm gonna go back. So there's a tool you can use called zsteg. Let me just run it without any parameters so we can get up the help options. And essentially this will check different sections of the image for data. So there are various tools you can use with steganography to various algorithms you can use to embed data in different bit planes. So in the color channels, the alpha channel, things like that. And you can use the least significant bits to hide data in and this will check them. So you can check all of them with the dash A flag. Let's try and run it. Zsteg dash A. What's it called? Confetti. So that ran through and it found this link. It also found PNG image. So you can see the PNG file header here. So it looks like there's a PNG image embedded inside that PNG image. So we can use zsteg again and this time we're going to use dash capital E to extract and then we're providing what we want to extract which is this extra data zero and then we'll provide the file name we run through that and that's actually printing out the PNG but we actually want to send it to a file so let's create new.png and we could have a look and see let me try and open these up first of all so we've got our original and then we've got a new one. They don't seem to look any different. So let's try and do diff. 
they do differ. I mean they should differ because we've extracted one from the other. Let's try and do zsteg-a on the new one. And you can see we've got another PNG image here in the same location. So let me just cancel that. Let me go back and do this again. This time we're going to extract the extra data from new PNG. Send it to new2. And let's have a look. And there's our flag. ACTF confetti for you. The next challenge is called Shark1. And the description says, My friend was passing notes during class. Can you find them? And we've been given a file to download again. So let's wget it. It's a PCAP file, so I'm going to open it up with Wireshark. And we can have a look through some of the traffic here. We don't have too much to look through. So let's take a look at the TCP traffic. When you've got TCP traffic, you can right click it and go to follow TCP stream. If we had UDP or HTTP traffic here, we'd probably do the same. But since we've only got TCP, we follow the stream and we get back our flag. Wireshark, do, 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 do. The next challenge is called Shark2, and the description says, My friend hasn't learned. And we've got another file to download. Sounds like it's going to be another packet capture. So we'll open it up with Wireshark. And again, we've got a little bit more traffic in here, so we could scroll through it and see what we've got. We can go into our statistics at the top and into protocol hierarchy and get an idea what type of data we have here. Maybe we want to focus on specific types of protocols so you can apply as a filter here. Let's select that. And here's some traffic. You could just go and start scrolling through that and see do we see anything of interest. Let's also right click it and follow the TCP stream. And we've got a message here. Hello. Hi, do you have the image for our project? Yeah, sending it now. Okay. So we could, first of all, we'll try export projects. But because this isn't HTTP traffic, we don't actually have any options to extract the image. Let's go back down to where that message was. The message was sent here. It said, yeah, sending it now. And then after that, we've got another TCP stream. So let's right click that and follow. Oh, it's not that one. That's the one we were just looking at. What I'll do is I'll go towards the end because this is where the end of the data is going to be. And I'll follow it there because it's not going to follow it from there. It's going to follow it from the start of the stream. And you can actually see here this JFIF is the header for a JPEG file. So we can change this to raw data because we want to save it as raw data. And I'll just call it test.jpg. We'll save the file. We'll open it up. And there's our flag. The next challenge is called the flash. It's a web challenge, and the description says, The new Justice League movies nerfed the Flash, so Clan made his own rendition. Can you get the flag before the Flash swaps it out at the speed of light? And we've been given this site to connect to. Let's open it up. And we've got this flag on the screen which says, This is not the flag. And I'm not sure if you saw it there, but it just very quickly swapped to something else. I could see it said the word speedy in it. But it's not staying there long enough for us to copy it anyway. So we might want to have a look at the our burp suite to see is there anything happening on the network side can we actually see it being sent and received but it's not it looks like it's happening with the JavaScript so let's open up our dev tools with F12 we can go into our d debugger and have a look at the code in here so we've actually got this flash.js you can beautify it down here so just make it a little bit easier to view and you could go through and try to decode this and deobfuscate it because this is where the flag is coming from. But there's an easier way to deal with this. We can go to our inspector where we have this object and we can right click here and break on subtree modification I think. Let's do that. Yep we did it and essentially what's happened is as it's been modified it's hit a breakpoint and this is where the breakpoint is down here and it's waiting for us to hit play so we can hit F8 or play to resume but now that we've got this here we can literally just go and take a copy of this flag and submit it. The next challenge is called auth skip 
and the description says Clam was doing his Angstrom CTF flag speedrun when he ran into the infamous time sink known in the speedrunning community as Orth. Can you pull off the legendary Orth skip and get past the flag? So let's open this up. We've got username and a password box. Maybe we just try our admin admin. Incorrect login. Maybe we'll try an SQL injection. Can we just put in a quote here and see do we get any thing of interest? We don't. Let's have a look. Have we got any cookies or anything being used? And we don't. So let's take a look at the source code. We were given the source code for this one. So we'll download it and make use of it. I'm going to open this up with Codium so I get some nice syntax highlighting. So let's trace through the logic here. We can see that the flag is being set from an environment variable and the goal is we want the flag. So the only place the flag is being used is down here. So we need to make a get request to the home directory and make sure that the user cookie is set to admin and then we'll get the flag. So how do we get that cookie? Well, it tells us here we can make a post request to login and if the username is admin and the password equals this math.random.toString then it's going to set a cookie for us where the cookie name is user and the value is admin. So how can we bypass that? Well, we can just go and create a cookie. So we'll go to our dev tools again, we'll go to our storage, we'll add a new cookie here, let me just hit on this plus symbol, it's called user and the value should be admin and if we refresh the page now you can see that we're logged in. The next challenge is called crumbs and the description says follow the crumbs. So this is our site to connect to, we've been given the server source code as well so let's take a look at that. Let's open that up again with Codium. So let's trace this back again. We've got a flag which is being created from this environment variable and we can see that the flag is used down here. So this is our goal is to make sure that this code is triggered and this code is using these paths. So let's have a look how these are set up. We've got a we've got an array of paths which is going to be filled up with a thousand paths and it's using the crypto.random UUID for each one of them. So imagine this paths array where you've got a thousand crypto.random UUID values in there and then at the end we've got the last path is being set to the flag. We need to loop through all of these in order to get to the flag. So there's going to be a thousand URIs that we've got to loop through. This is our slug, the ending part of the URI, before we'll get to the flag. So let's get a better idea how that looks. Let's go to the website. We open it up and it says go to and then we've been given this slug to put in. Let's put that in at the end. And you can see that it tells us to go to the next one. So we put that in at the end. That's it. It's telling us to go to the next one. Now, you can imagine this is going to take a little while because we need to do it a thousand times. So you've got a few different options here. What I initially did, I wasn't, I didn't know there was a thousand attempts to go through here. I just had a look at the site before I looked at the source code. And if there wasn't so many, you could quite easily use Intruder in Burp Suite because we can go here, let's set up a position on the URI. So I'm going to add those there. And then we go through and we say that we want to use a recursive grep. We'll go into the options and then we want to extract using the grep. So I'm going to say extract the following. I'm going to highlight this bit that we're going to want to extract each time. And it's going to be in the same position each time, so that's fine. You can either use regex or you can use a fixed length. So that's it. I'll hit OK there. And let's go back to our payloads. Now this is what's being used in the recursive grep. And what we'd also want to do is go and add a grep match as well. So we want to clear these and then say, if you get any responses that have ACTF in them, that means we've got the flag, and therefore we want to flag it. And that should be it. Let's try Let's try and start the attack. You just need to change the resources. It'll only allow 
one at a time. We run through that and that's going to keep going through. It starts off nice and quick but if you don't have Burp Pro it'll start getting slow. By the time we get to 100 requests it's going to be probably less than one a second, maybe like one request every two seconds. But yeah, you can see that's going through. We can go and have a look at the responses here. Each time we get the new response and the response is being sent as the next request. But as I say, that's going to take too long. I'm just showing that just in case you, anybody has not done that with Burt before and wanted to see how to use it. But a better way to do this will be to use a script. So let me go and copy over a script I put together for this one. Let me open up Codium exploit.py and let's paste this in here. Okay, so we've got the URL set here at the top. We've got an initial request which is going to come back and give us our first URI that we need to visit. And then we're going to loop through until we've got the flag in the response. So we know that's going to be a thousand times. But we're basically just saying while we don't have the flag in the response, we want you to extract this part of the page. We're using beautiful soup to do that. We're just going to pass it as HTML, so we're taking the P tags out of it and getting rid of that go to at the start. And then we're going to make a get request with that new URL. We'll keep doing that until we've got ACTF and then once we've found that we know that we've got to the end and we can simply print out the flag. So that's it, let's try it out. So we'll run python exploit.py and you can see it's running about the same speed as Burp Suite at the moment, but Burp Suite would slow down exponentially. This will take a few minutes to run, so I'll come back once this is finished and I'll speed up the video. So that took about four or five minutes to complete. You could probably actually do that quicker, considering that the we know what the initial value is from this crypto.random UUID. If we know what the first one is, we should be able to predict the remainders as well. So presumably if we use some JavaScript and actually use Node.js to do this, we wouldn't need to make the thousand requests. We could just do this loop based on the value of the first item and then work out what the thousandth is and then go straight to that URL. The next challenge is called Extra Salty Sardines and the description says Clam was intensely brainstorming new challenge ideas when his stomach growled. He opened his favourite tin of salty sardines, took a bite out of them and then got a revolutionary new challenge idea. What if he wrote a site with an extremely suggestive acronym being XSS? So we've got the site to connect to, we've been given some source code as well to download and we've also got this admin bot to connect to. Let's download the source code first of all. We've been given a big hint by the name of the challenge anyway. So again we can see that we've got our flag being loaded from the environment variable. We've got a password as well, a secret which is coming from the environment variable. We've got a character set of lowercase letters. We've got this gen ID function which is gonna get a 10 letter key basically, a 10 letter ID from these characters and then just using math.random and we've got our endpoints here. We've got a few endpoints so let's try and go through them. We've got get flag and only the admin will be able to access it because the cookie needs to have the correct secret in it which we won't have access to so the goal is going to be to get the admin to access this flag and then return that flag to us. We've got this MK sardine, so make sardine. It asks for a name. It's going to strip out some of these pesky characters, which are some of the ones we might want to use if we were injecting some JavaScript. And it's going to make sure it's within the correct length. And if it is, it's going to generate a random ID it's going to add that ID as a URI and it's going to redirect us. And if we try to access that URI that we just created, 
that's what's going to happen here. So it's going to make sure it exists. If not, it'll say it's not found. If it does exist, it's going to load the page. Okay, cool. So let's go and take a look at the site first of all. Remember, we've got this character stripping function. So it's going to try to replace ampersands and quotes and angular brackets. We'll go over here. Let's try and enter in. Let's just, as we normally would do, we might want to see if we can just add a script. And let's just say alert zero. Take a copy of it and let's submit that. And you can see it's basically stripped some of this out. So we might want to inspect it and see exactly what we've got in here. So it's got the scripts, alert zero, and then it didn't have the remainder of the scripts. Let me go back again. That all looks okay. You can see that it's inside this H1. So let's go back, let's do that again, and let's close that H1 tag first. Let's try that. And now we've got an alert, which is good. Let's see if we can go back again and let's change this to, let's do document dot location. And we want to change the location to something else. Let me go and set up a local web server. I'm going to do sudo python dash m for modules and then grab the HTTP server. Do it on port 80, which is why I've used sudo. And then to expose that to the internet, I'm going to use ngrok and we can give it different services and port numbers. I'm going to give it HTTP 80 because that's where I've got my web server running. And this is going to give us a URL that we can provide. So if I try to access this URL from a browser, it's going to take me to this directory on my local system. And you can see that a request was made here. And this is going to be a way for us to both exfiltrate data, but also see whether we have connectivity with our to the admin bot. So I want to put this in to these quotes. Click make sardine. And notice it didn't redirect us. So let's have a look at our H1 tag and let's see what's gone wrong. And we'll see that what's gone wrong here is we have this at, sorry, and apos instead of our first apostrophe. But notice it didn't strip the second one. And essentially this is because this dot replace is only going to replace the first character it comes across, which means if we submit these at the beginning, then we'll be able to use them from then on out without having them be converted. So let's verify that. Let's go back and before we close out this H1 tag, I'm going to put in those things. So we've got, uh, let's do our brackets, let's do an and, let's do our apostrophe and let's do our double quotes as well. And we'll go to make sardine. And notice this time it redirected me. So it changed the location to the site that we'd put in, which is good. We can now go and start playing around with our cross site scripting with our XSS payload. And then once we get something working, we'll send it to the admin. There's going to be a lot of different ways to do this as well. Let me show the payload that I used at the time for this. So I'm just going to paste this into our JavaScript page. In fact, let me create just so we've got some nice syntax highlighting, let me create exploit.html. Let's paste this in here. So we're just starting off with our quotes and our angular brackets to make sure that we can use them from then on out. We actually don't need all of this. We just need a single quote, a double quote. We could put in an and here as well. And then we've got our angular brackets. We're closing off that h1 tag and then we're putting in our script. So this is our script here. And the script is first of all going to fetch flag, the flag page, which we didn't even try yet. Let's go and try that. So we'll go here and do flag. And you can see that we can't view this. We need to be the admin. So let's go back. Oh, that was a little bit too big. And let's have a look at the rest of this. So it's going to fetch flag. And then it's going to take the response from that. And then it's going to fetch our ngrok address, which that's not the correct address. Let me go and get the new one. Oh, this is the other thing. I got stuck on this for a little bit earlier, and it seemed to be the reason was that I was using HTTP instead of HTTPS, and it didn't seem to be making the connection out. So yeah, we're going to make a connection to our local server, and we're going to submit the flag as a get parameter. 
Here I'm just base64 encoding the flag, although it's probably not actually needed in this case. Sometimes if you've got uh, some special characters in the response and stuff, you'll want to base64 encode it first of all. And that's about it. So that's the end of our script. We've just got, I got another h1 tag in here at the end, which was just for the exclamation mark, which pops up. But again, that's not really necessary either. And this should be fine as our payload. So we'll try it out. First of all, we'll just go and submit it, make sardine. And let's have a look at our dev tools again. You can see our script is in here. It looks good. So it's fetching flag. And then it's sending the response.txt to our local server. So just let's see, does our server have that response.txt? And it does. It's got this base64 encoded string. So we can take a copy of it. We can do echo, paste that in, and send it to base64-d. And we get this message, you can't view this. Because I'm not the admin. Only the admin can view the flag. But we know that it works. So it is trying to view the flag. And then it's sending the response from that request to our web server. So all we need to do now is take a copy of this XSS that we've just created, so this note that we've just posted, provide this to the admin bot and do our capture. We'll submit that. We'll go back to our HTTP server and look what we've got. We've got a new base64 encoder string. It's clearly different. So let's try it out. And there's our flag. The next challenge is called Art Gallery. And the description says, Bosch left his image gallery service running. Quick, get all of his secrets before he deletes them. And we've been given some source codes to download as well. So let's take a look at that. Wget, let's open this up with Codium. And there's not too much to look at here. So we can see that we've got this. Well, we can make a get request and it's going to call send file. It's going to join the path from the directory name and index.html. Or we can get the gallery directory and it will take the request.query.member. So it's going to take a parameter called member, which it's going to use to select a file from images. Otherwise, it's going to give us this error.html. Let's test it out, see how it looks when we view it. We've got a drop down menu and we can select something from it and click submit. And then we get this image showing up. So the first thing we probably want to try and do, can we access ETC password? And we can't. Can we use directory traversal? So let's go back one directory. Nope. Let's go back two directories. And look what we've got. We've got this gallery file. I'm not going to save it. I'm going to go over to Burp Suite and take a look at it here. And you can see that is our ETC password file. So we might want to send this to the repeater and play around with this. Can we access the shadow file, for example? And we can access the shadow file, but there's nothing of interest in here. We were given a hint in the challenge description which says, get all of his secrets before he deletes them. We also know that it's a Node.js application. We can see that from the source code. We could also have a look at our Wappalizer browser extension and see what frameworks and servers are being used here. So that gives us a hint. You could go and get a LFI word list as well and go and brute force to try and see what files we can access. In this case, let's try and go back. Well, we're already back. Let's just see what we, let's just, instead of going into ETC, we'll try and go into the app directory and then .git and then see if we can access the head. So we're going to logs and then head, try and load it and we get another file coming back. So we can go into Burp Suite and have a look and see what that looks like. And we can see some commits in here. So you could go through and manually enumerate this. You can also use a tool called Git Dumper. Let's have a look, Git Dumper. I think this is just a Python package. You can install this with pip install. And it takes in the URL and then a directory that we want to dump the git into. So let's do git dumper. Oh, let me make a directory first of all. Let's make directory new. Let's do git dumper. 
let's pass in that URL to the git home directory and then pass in the new directory, that's where we want to dump it to. We'll run through that and you'll see it's actually finding all of these files. But we get an error here saying index object has no attribute iter blobs. So we've got a couple of options. We could go back to the manual enumeration. We've got some URLs now we can go and check out. Or we can go and try and find out what this error is about and how can we fix it. So to do that, we probably want to have a look at the git dumper repo. I'll go to the GitHub. It's not that one, I think it's this one, but this is the Python page. Where is the repo? Okay. Git dumper. Let's go into issues. And let's just take this out and let's search for that error that we're getting. And look at this, we've got a few of these issues that were raised over the past month. It was one two hours ago, so let me take a look at that one. And somebody was getting a similar error and they were told at line 583 in git dumper.py change the deprecated iter blobs to iter objects. Okay, so let me locate git dumper. And you see I've only got one file here. Let me print that out. You can see that it's importing git dumper, so let's look for that. And here's our git dumper.py, so let's open that up in Codium. Open. And let's have a look. What did it say? 583. So I'm going to go down to line 583. And it wanted us to change that from iter blobs to iter objects. Save that. And let's try that again. There we go, it's looking better. So now we'll cd into the new directory and see what we've got in here. We probably want to, let's try and grep for, now notice as well that's not showing everything because we have this .git directory which we're going to be interested in. And let me just try and grep recursively and case insensitive will look for ACTF in everything. Okay, no sign of anything. Okay, so that's fine. Let's instead do git log and we can see that we've got these different commits then. We have one where there was add program, remove vital secrets, and then bury secrets. So I'm interested to see what they did when they removed the vital secrets. So I'm going to take a copy of this commit ID and I'm going to do git log dash p to show us the patch differences. Paste in that commit ID and this is going to show us what changed. And you'll see what happened is they removed flag.txt and flag.txt contained this flag. So I haven't actually submitted this one, let's submit it now. And there we go. On to the reversing category, the first challenge is called baby3. And the description says this program doesn't do anything. So let's download the program and see what it does. We'll make it executable first of all, chmod plus x, shall, and let's try and run it. We try to run it, we get an error. We could try and run it with ltrace on, to see do we get anything else. Nope, let's try and open it up with gdb dash pwn debug. This is for the pwn debug plugin, but gdb will be fine as well. We'll open this up and let's have a look. We've got info functions. We can see we've got this main function here, nothing else of interest. Let's try and disassemble the main function. And immediately the first thing I notice here is that we have some literal values being moved into registers. So we have this one being moved into the RAX register this one into the RDX and then these are being moved from the RAX and RDX to some memory locations and then some new values are being add, moved into the RAX, RDX and this repeats three times. So these look like hex values which are representing ASCII characters. We can confirm that by doing unhex and then we paste that in and we'll see the beginning part of the flag. Notice that it's in reverse order because of the endianness. But we have A, C, T, F, our first curly bracket, and then E, M, H. So there's a few different ways we could approach this. What I'm going to do is go to Cyberchef, and I'm going to take a copy of this, 
I'm gonna swap the endianess. In fact, let's go from hex so I can see what's happening first of all. We'll go from hex and you can see again we've got the same output. So now what I'm gonna do is swap endianess. We'll double click on that, let me move that up a bit. And we'll just play around with this until we get to the right stage. It's gonna be eight. So you can now see we've got ACTF EMH, which is looking good. We want to get the rest of the flag now, so I'm going to take a copy of that, and you can see it's starting to fill up. Let's grab this as well. And that's the flag, but it's not quite looking right. We've got some unrecognized characters here, so let's try and remove this pad in, pad incomplete words option. And there we go, now we've got our full flag. The next challenge is called Number Game, and the description says, step right up and enter Clam's Number Game. Winners get one free flag. So we've been given the server address and port to connect to once we get things working locally. Let's download the binary first of all. And again, we'll make it executable. We'll try and run it. It asks us for a number, let's just put in a number. And it says you didn't win. So I normally try Ltrace just to see if there's a simple comparison being done. But there isn't. We could open this up in GDB Pwn Debug again. But this time I'm going to open it up in Geardra. I'm going to use this Geardra Auto script, which just speeds up the process a little bit. So Geardra opens up, we've got our decompiler here on the right where we'll get our decompiled code, we've got our assembly code here on the left, and then we've got our program sections up here, we've got our functions and imports and exports and stuff here. So we want to go straight to our main function on the left, and this will provide us with the code on the right, or we can have a look at the assembly code. As you step through these, whenever you click on a line on one side, it'll point to what that code relates to on the other side as well. And typically what I'll do here is go through and start renaming some things so that we know exactly what we're working with. For example, we know that it asks us a number at the beginning, so I'm going to change this to first number. You can right click and rename or you can type L on the keyboard to bring up the rename option. And it's going to check to see if our first number equals this value, which is currently in hex. So you can see we can either highlight it to get the decimal value or we can right click and convert it. And there we go, and then it's going to, well we could go and try this now and see what happens, but we can also see here, so we can see that it's going to ask us for another number. I'm going to change this to second num. And it's going to then find out if the first number we entered plus the second number we entered equal this, which I'm also going to convert. Then we get on to the next part, and you can see that it is asking us another question, it's using F gets this time and it's asking us the airspeed velocity of an unladen swallow. Now this is a string compare being done so I'm going to change this, I'm going to say this is our third and this is a string and there we go and we need to make sure that we enter in, oh this is the answer that we need to provide. Our question was up here, our question is that was the easy part, now what's the 42nd number of the Maltese alphabet? and this is our answer. And that's it, it's going to print the flag. So we could go to put together a really small Python script, use Pwn tools or something to input all these answers, but uh, it's probably just as easy just to go and do this manually now. So let's try and run the program. We'll enter in our first number, so I'll we'll take a copy of this. Oh. Let's take a copy of that. And that was good. So now we need to find out what is 51337 minus that number we just entered. So let's do that. Let's uh, go to Python and let's say 51337 1337 minus that number. There's our answer. Let's take a copy of it. Let's submit that and then it asks us what is the 42nd number of the Maltese alphabet. We'll take a copy of the string which is expecting We'll go back and we'll submit that, and there we go. So it tried to read the flag file, 
which means we need to do this remotely. So we'll take a copy of the server address and port number. Let me minimize this so we can see things a little bit better. We'll connect to that and then we need to supply this number first. We need to supply this number second. And we need to supply this reference. And there's our flag. The next challenge is called What's My Name? It's the first potent challenge and the description says, can you guess my name? So we've got a server address and a port number to connect to. And we've got two files to download, a binary and the source code for it as well. So I've already downloaded them this time around. Let's open up the source code and take a look at it. As usual, we'll backtrace this. So we'll find out where the flag is printed and try and work out what conditions we need to meet. So we've got the flag down here. It's going to be open, it's going to be printed to the screen, and the condition that needs to be met is this string compare of my name and guess needs to return zero, so these two strings need to match. And it's comparing 48 characters, so it's comparing 48 characters from these two variables. So how are these generated? Well, we've got a your name here, but if we look at this, it doesn't actually seem to be used anywhere. It's not compared down here and it's not used in any other way so we can probably ignore that let's take a look at the my name so this is called through generate name and it's going to take 48 random bytes from dev u random and it's going to return those so essentially we're being asked to guess 48 characters to see if they match the 48 characters taken from dev u random so where's the vulnerability here well this is actually quite similar to a challenge from last year. Let me open up my GitHub. Go into CTF. CTF events. Angstrom 21. Binary. Secure login. It was kind of a similar challenge, so we can have a look at this here. We had a dev u random which is open. It takes 128 bytes in this case and it simply asks us for a password and it's going to compare 100 and well it's actually just comparing a whole string in this case so 128 bytes from the input to the password and essentially the issue is here that the dev u random is going to return well in our case it's going to return 48 random bytes the problem is this string compare and strn compare will end at the terminator so if the first byte of this generate name, if the first byte of this returns as a null byte, that's basically going to act as a terminator. So it's going to be comparing nothing essentially to whatever we provide. So in the previous year's competition, what I did here was loop through a thousand times and just send off a null byte as the password. And we're basically just hoping that, you know, once in every 256 iterations, that dev u random is going to return a null byte as the first byte, which means we'll simply be comparing null to null. And that's essentially what we've done here. So let me take a copy of the script that I put together. Exploit.py. So we're going to loop through a thousand times. Don't worry about this stuff at the top. It's just a template. So this just makes it easy to swap between locally running the binary locally, running it remotely and running it with GDB enabled and you can set up some GDB commands in here. We've got the binary set and then just some login information as well. So nothing, I didn't change anything at all here. I just copied and pasted the script and I just updated the binary name. I also set this to warn just to minimize the output because every time this program starts, it's going to start a thousand times and every time it does, if you don't have this set to warn, it's going to come up with quite a lot of uh, information. So that's it, a thousand times, just send off, doesn't matter what the username is, remember it's not actually being used at all, so that can be anything. And then when it asks us for the password, we're sending a null byte, we need to receive an, a new line. I actually got stuck on this a little while because I was searching for the flag in the line that came back, but a blank line comes back first, so it was never returning anything, we actually need the second receive. And that's about it. So we're going to wait until we get this ACTF in the response. And when we do, we're going to print it out and then we're going to exit the program. So let's try it out. Let me first of all create a fake flag. I'm going to put ACTF and then just flag in here. We'll send that to flag.txt and then we'll run the exploit. 
And there we go, we've got back our ACTF flag. So let's go ahead and we can run this against the remote server now very easily just by typing in remote in capital letters. We can take a copy of the server address and port number and we send this off. This might actually take a little while because it was, whenever I tried this earlier, it was running at about one request per second. So I'll pause the video, I'll come back once this is returned. So that took about two or three minutes to complete and we've got back our flag. The next challenge is called WA and the description says baby friendly. And we've got our source codes download, we've got a binary and we've got the server address and port number to connect to. Let's open up the source code first of all. And there's not too much to it, we've got a main function which has a buffer of 24 characters defined called cry. And then it is calling gets with the cry buffer. So you can see this is actually highlighted here, I don't know whether this has given us a warning about the security issues. Let's go and take a quick look at the man page for gets. And we will see that we should never use gets because it's impossible to tell without knowing the data in advance how many characters gets will read and because gets will continue to store characters past the end of the buffer it's an extremely dangerous function to use. It's been used to break computer security. Use fgets instead. So it's an inherently dangerous function. fgets will actually make you specify how many characters or how many bytes you want to read whereas gets won't. So without us putting in some kind of manual validation here there's really nothing we could do. We've got another function here called flag. We can see that's going to open the flag. It's going to print it to the screen. The problem is it's never called so it's never referenced anywhere else in this code. There's no way that somebody running this program should be able to execute this function. And our goal is going to be to do just that. So the whole point here is if we can use gets to overflow the buffer and overwrite the return address so where the function is going to return to and say that actually we want it to return to this flag function instead. So there's a few different ways we can go about doing that. We could open this up in Geardra to take a look at the layout of the stack instead. I'm going to open this up with GDB. Let's try and just kind of solve this manually. So let's do gdb debug and then open up the binary. Let's have a look at our functions. And we'll see here that the address of the flag function is 401236. We know that we want to overflow the buffer. We need to overflow that cry variable and make sure that we overwrite the return address on the stack with the address of this flag function. And then it should jump there. So how can we identify how many bytes we need to write? So there's a few different ways we can do this. And we'll have a look at a way to automate this in a second, but we can actually identify it manually as well. We can see we've got this 24 byte buffer here. These characters are a byte each. We've also got an eight byte variable here on the stack. So that's gonna take us up to 32. And then we have the saved RBP as well, which is saved whenever a function is called, so it knows where to return to. So that's going to take us up to 40 bytes, which means we need to write 40 bytes before we're going to have control of the return address, which is going to decide where the program returns. It should be returning to where it was called from, but we're going to try and redirect it to this flag function. Another way we can do this a bit more automatically is to generate a cyclic pattern in GDB. I'm going to generate a cyclic pattern of 100 bytes. I'm going to take a copy of it and then run the program. Paste that in. And you see that we crashed the program. And we can actually have a look and see what we've got in the RSP here. So this KAAA is what would make it into the RIP. If this was a 32-bit program, you'd actually see this in the EIP. But because it's 64-bit and it knows it's an invalid address, it won't even show it in the... RIP there, but we can now take this, we can say cyclic-l to look that up and find that the offset is at 40 bytes. We need to write 40 bytes and then we need to put the return address of that flag function, which let's have a look at that again. Let's disassemble flag and here's the address that we want to provide. So let's try this kind of manually. First of all, let's take a copy of the stress. I'm going to go and use Python 2 which we need to use just due to the way that it prints certain bytes. And we'll say print a times 40, which is going to take us up to that RIP, to our instruction pointer. 
and then we want the address of the hacked function. We need to put this in little endian format, which means like reverse order. So we'll reverse the bytes. We'll do make sure it's in hex, and we'll do 36 first, and then we'll do 12, and then we'll do 40, and then we'll do 00, 00, 00. 00. Just take it up to a 64-bit address. So we've got eight bytes there. We print this out. It's not actually going to show this properly because some of these bytes aren't going to print as ASCII characters. And let me just show as well, if we did this in Python 3, we're probably going to run into some problems. Well, yeah, we're going to run into that problem first of all, but let's have a look and see what other problems we run into. Okay, it's actually the same in this case. Quite often Python 3 will represent some of these bytes differently, so it's just worth bearing in mind. So I'm going to use Python 2. I'm going to send it to a file called payload because we can't just copy and paste this because it doesn't print all the characters. And then I'm going to try and run the program and send in that payload. And you'll see we've got this error missing flag.txt, which is a good sign. That means it's tried to print the flag. So let's take a copy of this. And let's use netcat. Let's send that payload through. And there we get back our flag. So that's called a return to win challenge. We've returned to a function called flag or called win or something like that, which has given us the flag. We can also automate this using a script. So let me open up a Pwn Tools script, exploit.py. Just going to paste this in here. Very simple. We're also finding out the instruction pointer offset here. So I've got a function which is going to automatically do that. It's basically going to run the program. It's going to send it those 100 cyclic bytes that we did in GDB. It's going to wait for the program to crash. And then it's going to read the core dump and try and find out what the instruction pointer offset is. So this is just the same as typing in here 40. You could just type 40 there and just delete this whole function. I just have it there just to automate things a little bit. And we've also then got our payload, which is just going to say at the offset you identified, which is going to be 40, we want you to pack this flag address. So we can actually just access the functions directly from the binary. So this would just be the same as us doing 0x and then putting in that address, that flag address that we just got. But this will, it's a bit more of a user friendly way to do that. So let's try and run Python exploit. We run it, it should come up with an error saying missing flag, which it does. Let's run it again. And now just type in remote in capital letters. We take a copy of the server address and port number again. And we run through that. And there's our flag. The next challenge is called Really Obnoxious Problem. And the description says, you know the drill. We've got a binary to download, no source code this time. And then we've got the server address and port number to connect to once we get things working locally. So I've already downloaded the file. Let me first of all run checksec. We've not done that on the previous challenges, but let's do that now. This is the first time we don't have access to the source code. And this will just let us know what is likely to be the intended solution for the challenge, or at least rule out what's not likely to be. So for example, in this case, we can see NX is enabled, which basically just means that any shellcode we inject onto the stack is not going to be executable. So we can probably rule that out unless we need to use some tricks to get around it. We've also got no stack canaries, which is a good indication there'll be a buffer overflow here. Now there could be a buffer overflow with stack canaries, but it would just mean we'd have to get around this protection as well. And then no pi just means the address is going to be the same each time it loads. Also worth noting that it's 64 bits, so that will be important depending how we want to set up our exploits in terms of preparing parameters and things like that. So I'm not going through that anymore. I've done a series recently on binary exploitation where this is covered in quite a lot of detail and we look at how to bypass all these different protections when they are enabled. Let's just go ahead and I've already made this executable. Let me run the program. Let's just try and put in some long input and see do we get. Okay, it's asking us for two inputs. Let's try that again. So put in a name and we've got a segmentation fault at the address. So it looks like it might have been that some of that overflowed into the address call and that's where the buffer overflow is rather than at the name parameter. We could verify that with GDB so we could go and do our cyclic pattern again. What I'm going to do instead is open it up with Geirdra. So I'm going to use that Geirdra auto script that we used earlier. Make sure this is in a temp directory and it's going to auto analyze the binary. And let's jump straight over to our functions on the left into the main function we can see that it calls vuln, so we'll just double click that. 
it's going to read in a name and you can see that it's using this data section which is actually just reading in 49 characters so I'm going to rename that to 49 percentage s that's basically the format specifier and it's reading that into name which is also a section of the binary and then we've got this get char it's going to call printf for the address and then here's our vulnerability so here's the gets call the dangerous gets call with no nothing to check that what we're going to provide is going to actually fit into this buffer I'm also going to rename this to buffer as well and so yeah this is basically it we need to overflow the buffer and overwrite the return address with this flag function we can see here the difference is this flag function takes in some parameters so we can't just simply call the flag function and expect it to print the flag we need to call the flag function and make sure that the first parameter provided to the function is 0x1337 and then the second parameter is bobby now the only thing here is string compare uses the strings as pointers so it's not actually looking for we can't just provide the bobby as a string as a parameter this little star here means we need to provide the address of bobby so we need to find the string bobby somewhere in the program and provide that address or we would need to write the string bobby somewhere to the program or to the stack and provide that address instead hopefully that makes sense we need to meet these two conditions and then we'll be able to print the flag because this is a 64-bit binary we need to prepare these parameters by popping the first one into the RDI register and then popping the second one into the RSI register and that's how it will read in the parameters, that's a calling convention if we were doing this with a 32-bit binary instead the parameters would just come after the function on the stack making sure that you remember the return address as well which will be needed for the you'll need to pad that out if it was 32-bit Anyway, I've done challenges like that before where I've showed how that's done. Let's go ahead and do it with this challenge as well. And we need to go and find the gadgets in order to do that. So we need a pop RDI gadget to pop the first value into the RDI register. We need a pop RSI gadget to pop the second one into the RSI. So as ever, there's quite a few ways we can do this. What I'm going to use here is ROPPER to check the ROP gadget. So we'll pass in the file name and then I'm going to search for pop RDI and you'll see that we've got the address then of a pop RDI gadget we also need a pop RSI so we'll look for that as well and we have a pop RSI the only thing is we don't have a a gadget that just pops the RSI we've got one that pops RSI and then pops R15 so we just need to make sure that whenever we're popping the second parameter into the RSI we make sure that we leave some pad in there some junk in order just to fill this R15 and make sure everything's aligned properly so there's the two gadgets. The other thing we need is to find out the address of this bobby string. So we can actually see the address here. Another way to do this, which I quite often do, is use GDB. So we can do GDB pwn debug and let's run the program. I'm going to hit Control and C and then I'm going to search. And you can see here search takes in what type you want to search for. I'm going to search for string and I think you can actually just use dash s yeah you can see the dash s here is the same as that so I'm going to search dash s bobby and we'll find the address here as well so we can literally take a copy of this address and that's the address we need to provide as the second parameter rather than providing the string okay hopefully that makes sense what I'm going to do now is open up exploit.py where I've put together an exploit to do everything we just described like in the previous challenge, I'm using this template, so I've got a function here which is going to identify the offset of the RIP, which again, we could identify manually. We can go back to our vuln function, we can have a look at our gets. We've got a 64-byte buffer here. We don't have anything else on the stack, so it's actually going to be 64 plus 8. It's going to be 72 bytes for the RIP. And that's all it's doing here, so it's passing in 500 cyclic bytes to find that. But again, we could just type in here 72 and take out that function if we wanted to. We're also preparing our parameters. So we've got the 1337 is a literal value to go into the RDI. And then we need the pointer to Bobby in the RSI, which is the address we just saw in Geirdra and in GDB. 
we've got our gadgets which we just took from Ropper and then we're going to build our payload. So before we can call elf.functions.flag we need to first pop the first parameter into the RDI register and the second parameter into the RSI and then some junk for the R15 because we couldn't find a gadget that we needed and then we call flag. So again this is just how the program is going to read the parameters, it, that's the calling convention, it's going to read from those registers and that should be it. So again this has been sent off for this offset so it's 72 bytes in, it's just going to send 72 bytes of cyclic pattern, cyclic padding to get up to the correct offset. And then we send off the payload, so let's try it out, let's run python exploit and we get error missing flag.txt which is a good sign so we could create a flag.txt locally but it's really not needed let's just take a copy of this server address and port number let's run it again and use remote paste in the server address port number we run through that and we get back our flag another way we could do that as well is to use rop objects let me take a copy of another script that I put together which automates this process a little bit so we create a rop object here from the elf binary and we're literally just going to say that we want you to call rop.flag which is the function and we want you to pass in these parameters the leet and then the pointer to bobby it's going to search for bobby in the binary and then it'll find that address and then rather than having to do everything as we just did there where we put all this together in a payload and we look for a pop rdi and rsi and we fill up our pad and stuff like that it's going to do all of that for us so we can actually print this out let me do pretty print rop.dump and this will show us what the chain is going to look like let me let's run that again you can see at the start it's identifying the offset so it's reading the core dump it finds this at 72 bytes in and here we go it's putting together our payload so it's doing the exact same thing we did which was to put leet into the RDI so that's 4919 in decimal and then it's going to put the address of Bobby into the RSI, some padding into the R15, and then call flag. The next challenge is called Where Am I? And the description says, click on the eyes. So we've got these two links here. The first one is to the Where Am I binary, and the second one is to the libc library that's used on the remote system. So I've already downloaded both of those. Just before we take a look at them, let me just mention that you can use this tool called Pwn Init to patch your binary with the libc library that's downloaded. So if we were to run this binary that we've been given locally it's going to use our libc which could be a different version to the one that's being used on the remote server. So yeah we can use Pwn in it to patch the binary to make it use the libc file that we download. It does some other things as well. I've actually modified mine slightly because I don't like using the template that they that it generates so I've modified mine slightly but it works pretty much the same in that we'll run pwn in it on the binary which is where am I and it's going to patch it and it's going to come back and just provide me with the libc and ld paths which I'll then go and put into a script and actually just before we get started I'm going to go and grab a script from another CTF challenge so quite often the attack that we're going to do here, the return to libc attack, comes up very frequently as a pwn challenge in capture flag competitions and quite often very little needs to be changed if you use this template that I use for pwn challenges. So just to go through how this works, so we've got our exploit here, we find out what the offset is to the instruction pointer, so how many bytes we need to overflow the buffer with in order to have control of the return address and we're going to then do two payloads. The first one is going to leak a libc function address because even though we have the same libc that's going to be used on the remote system, the remote system is going to have different addresses. So we'll know what all the offsets are between the functions but we won't actually know what the base address of the libc library is. So we need to leak one of the functions in order to do that and that's what this first payload does. The second payload is going to do our return to system. So we're going to first of all identify what the address of the libc library is. We're going to work out all our offsets from there. So what is the offset from the function that we leaked back to the base address of libc? And then what is the offset from the base of libc to the system function that we want to call? 
and to the bin sh string that we want to pass into the system function call. So that's our second payload as well. So we need to find some gadgets like our pop RDI gadget to prepare this register for the function call and we need to either go and identify the offsets in the libc library or you can actually load libc into the pwn tool scripts like this so that you can quite easily call functions and things from the binary kind of how we do here when we use elf.plt.put so elf.symbols.main or elf.functions.main we could also do that by hard coding the addresses providing that pi is not enabled but this uh, makes things a little bit easier and also more portable because we can then quite easily just take a copy of this which is what I'm going to do. I'm going to download this and create an exploit.py. I'm going to paste this in and we'll use this to start forming our exploit and you'll see hopefully how little needs to be changed. If you've never done a return to libc attack before that might have been a bit confusing but I'm going to explain this a lot more as we go through it. And also what I'll do is just comment out a lot of this stuff so that we can first focus, let's first focus on the first payload which is going to leak the address. So I'll comment this stuff out which is going to do the actual exploitation and we'll focus on what's up here first of all. We'll need to go and update the binary name to where am I and we also need to find out what the input and output is. So in this case my payload is set up to identify the instruction pointer offset. It's going to wait to receive a question mark and then it's going to send the payload. So we want to just run the binary, where am I, and see what's it asking, and it's actually exactly the same here, so I don't even need to change that part. All we're going to do is try to overflow the buffer from here, and see do we crash the program, which we do, we get a segmentation fault, so we've overflown something, which has caused the program to crash. So that's good, we don't need to change this function at all, all we need to do is put in the name here, and we can actually go ahead and just test this out right now. So the other thing is this pop RDI gadget. Like we did on the previous challenge, let's go and use ropper and pass in the file and we'll search for a pop RDI gadget. And we just need to go and update this address with the current one. And let's go ahead and just try and run the exploit. So we'll run through that. This is starting off by finding out what the offset is to the instruction pointer. So it's overwritten 72 bytes before it's getting to the RIP. And then we've got stuck here. Let's see what's okay. So we're sending this. It's waiting for a angular bracket. We actually need that to be a question mark. Let's run that again. We run through and you can see it's actually leaked out this puts address. It's leaked out a libc base address. Well, didn't leak out the base address, it leaked out the puts address which is what we printed here. So we populated the RDI with the global offset table puts address and then we put that out to the screen and that's leaked our puts address. We can now just subtract the offset of puts in the libc library to get back to the base address which is exactly what is happening down here. And then from there we can calculate our way to system and to bin sh and stuff like that. Okay, so I just want to show how little needs to be changed quite often for these challenges. Sometimes the most time will be spent for me in dealing with the send lines and receive lines, depending on the input and output of the program. Quite often I spend more time fixing that than the actual exploits themselves. But okay, we've leaked some addresses. Let's go and open this up in Geardra, which we should have done really at the start. I'm just kind of skipping ahead a little bit here because... I thought it would be good just to show that we can, this is how I would normally approach a pwn challenge, is to go and pick up one of my old scripts from GitHub and see how little I can get away with changing. Okay, so geared open, I just want to show what's different about this challenge, so if we go to our main function, we can see our code here, so we've got our buffer which is, let me rename it here. We've got the 60 byte buffer. So remember our offset to the instruction pointer was 72 bytes. So we had this 60 byte buffer. We've also got this variable here. This is four bytes. As you can see there, length is four bytes. And then we also have the saved RBP, which is eight bytes. That takes us up to 72 bytes. And then we're at the return address where we can overwrite where we want the program to go. So in our last challenge, we had a flag function that we could jump to. This one we don't, which is why we're doing this return to libc attack. And even if we didn't have access to the libc library that's used on the remote server, we could go and identify that manually by using 
a site like the libc database libc.bluecat there's another one which seems to be more accurate but i can't remember it now off the top of my head and basically we can go here and we can actually provide say we tried this on if we didn't have the remote server version let me just run the binary again the exploit again so we could grab this puts address whenever we run this against the server and we would provide this here and then just put in here puts and we'll look for libc libraries that are possibly used on the server so we can click on this one for example and we can go and see what the offsets are to the different functions and this is how you would do this if you don't know what libc library the server is using in our case we know which it's using so we know what all the offsets are so we don't need to worry about it but just mention that as well and the goal here is first of all we want to leak one of these functions now I've leaked puts but we could leak printf or gets or something else and essentially we're interested in the address that this points to so whenever an address from libc a function from libc is used for the first time it'll populate the global offset table with the address of that on the system to begin with these are all just addresses these are stubs essentially which will then look up the correct address and once populated they'll be able to it'll, that'll be used to refer to it there's a bit of complexity around this because we have a global offset table dot plt procedure linkage table we've also got a global offset table and we have a plt and then a plt.got as well um, so i've talked about these before in if you check out my binary exploitation series i went through this a little in a little bit of detail so i'll try not to waste too much more time here so anyway we go through once we have a buffer overflow here at this gets call and we're going to leak out the address of puts so now we can do another payload to return to system the problem is whenever we did gets remember we have this payload here where we leak out the global offset table put stress and then we return back to main and the problem is we're going to return back to main it's going to run through this again and it's going to get to this point here where it says if the counter is greater than zero then exit the program and the counter will be greater than zero because it was incremented just before we did our first buffer overflow so essentially we need to reset this counter in order to do a second payload and the counter is in the .bss section of the binary so you can see here we'll go into bss you can see we've got our counter right here and we need to find some way to overwrite that just to confirm that let us go back to our payload that we put together here so the second part of our payload was to try and actually get a shell so I'm going to uncomment this part I'm going to run through this again let's do python exploit and we get this broken pipe because we exited the program with code 1 and that's exactly what happened there we exited we exited here with uh, a 1 so yeah we need to reset that counter now a way that we could do that is we have a gets call here so we know that we can call gets and gets takes in the string pointed to a string that we want to save it to so at the moment it's pointing to this character buffer whenever we call gets it's pointing to this character buffer and it's saying read something in read some data in from the standard input i.e from us the user and store it in this buffer variable in this uh, on the stack so we can simply provide a different address to gets and say we want you to provide it to this address the counter which is 40406c and then we provide our zeros in the standard input or null bytes in order to overwrite that part of the counter so what i'm going to do is copy over the scripts that i put together whenever i solve this I've not changed too much here we've got the first payload has the leak in the puts address as it did previously but before going back to the start or the main function it also needs to call gets so we're going to pop the counter address which we got from Girdra into the RDI and I'm going to call gets and that means it's going to be waiting for an input from us so we're going to send these null bytes after we've sent the payload and that's going to overwrite that counter in the .bss section with some null bytes so that it's reset there's nothing else changed there nothing else changed here the only other thing is we added a return gadget as well which is needed for stack alignment to make sure it's 16 byte aligned and again you can find that with ropper so we can do ropper dash dash file 
where am I? And then we can search for, or we can simply grep out a return instruction, and then we just take the address of that. And that should be it. Let's go ahead and try to run it locally. And it looks like it's worked okay. We've got a shell. If we take away that stack alignment that we added, let's try that. So we got an end of file that time. So it is required. It's not always required, but more often than not, it seems to be. And that's about it. So now that we've got that running locally, all we have to do is go and take a copy of the server address and port number. And because we're using the same libc library on our local system, remember this is added into the script based on what Pwn init produced at the beginning. You can see I've just copied and pasted that. And yeah, we can just run it again. We just put in remote at the end, paste in the server address and port number, and this should give us a shell. Okay, we've got a shell. We can cut out flag.txt, and there we go. Hopefully that made sense. I did speed through that a little bit because I've done a lot of videos on these return to libc style challenges, but this one had a bit of a twist in it, which was having to reset the counter. And actually it took me quite a while to get that. I was stuck on it for a good bit of time. Uh, one other thing, just before we wrap it up, we could also automate this a little bit so we can use our ROP objects like we have in the previous challenge. And rather than putting it together our payload manually, we can just say here we want to call rop.puts and print out the global offset table puts address. We want to then call rop.gets and provide the counter so we can provide elf.symbols.counter. We don't even need to go and work out what that address is or hard code it. And then we want to go back to the start. And we can also just print that out just to see how Pwn Tools is going to put together that rop chain for us. We send that off as our first payload. Everything else here is exactly the same. And then when we get down to our libc attack, we are going to create a new ROP object from the libc binary. We're going to search for the bin sh string in there and then we're going to pass that to system. And again, it's just going to do all that for us. So we're going to print out the ROP.dump. We'll print out the ROP chain and see how they've structured it. We do need the stack alignment return gadget still, but we can find that using ROP as well, using the ROP object. And yeah, this is exactly the same. It's just, again, I quite like this format because as you saw with the script that I have here, this script, I've used pretty much the same script on like a hundred challenges now where you only need to change a couple of lines in order to get it working. And in doing this, this just makes it even more reliable in terms of if you see another challenge like this, we can just go and grab the script, probably change very little and get the shell or get the flag. Uh, so that's that. Let's just make sure this also works. Python exploit, we run through this, and again we've got a shell, so we'll do the same thing, remote, and we'll paste in the server address and the port number, in fact do I still have it here, there we go, and you can see that we've now got the flag again. And that's going to wrap it up for this Angstrom 2022 CTF video. I'll put all the scripts up onto my GitHub into the CTF event, so there'll be an Angstrom 2022 folder. And if you're interested in seeing more Pwn challenges, particularly, I've got a binary exploitation series. In fact, I did a couple of binary exploitation walkthrough series on YouTube, so you can check those out. And yeah, if you have any questions or comments, leave them down below. Thanks.